Welcome fellow bookworms to Timber's Den. My name is Whitney and today we have the final books of 2022. So this first part here is a haul, uh, well three hauls that I've done recently uh, and then I'm gonna do a separate clip after Christmas and show you guys what I got for Christmas because today is only the 22nd um, which I'm so excited Christmas is almost here and when you're seeing this Christmas has passed so if you celebrate I hope that you had a great holiday um, and whatever you celebrate I hope you had a good time and was able to spend it with friends and family but yeah we got lots of books to go over so let's go ahead and jump in so two of these are from the little church the store um two of the halls uh i love going there they always have some good stuff so uh paperbacks are 50 cents hardbacks are a dollar um and so two of those are from there and then the rest I went down to the bigger city to visit my grandparents for Christmas and then I stopped at the used bookstore down there. There's two locations I went to both so got a big stack and then I did a thrift books order to kind of fill in some of the stuff that I did not find at the used bookstore. So uh, yeah let's go ahead and jump in. So this first little stack isn't too many. I got six books um, but yeah, so the first one is Cold Hearted Rake by Lisa Kleypas. So um, I got turned on to this author by B at Mama Needs to Read Romance. She's always talking about this author. And I found um, one of the Friday Harbor series and picked it up. It was the third in the series. Ended up getting the first two because the first one is Christmas. So it worked perfectly. And we actually buddy read that one. It's uh, Christmas Eve at Friday Harbor um, or Christmas with Holly because it was turned into a movie and then reprinted as Christmas with Holly. Um and so, so yeah, I've been keeping an eye out for this author and found this one. This is the first in a series. I forget the name, but I'll put it here, of course. And so this one says, um, a twist of fate. One is most wickedly charming rake has just inherited an earldom, but his powerful new rank in society comes with unwanted responsibilities and more than a few surprises. His estate is saddled with debt and the late Earl's three innocent sisters are still occupying the house, along with Kathleen, Lady Trainer, a beautiful young widow whose sharp wit and determination are a match for Devon's own. A clash of wills. Kathleen knows better than to trust a ruthless scoundrel. Sc scoundrel like Devin, but the fiery attraction between them is impossible to deny, and from the first moment Devin holds her in his arms, he vows to do whatever it takes to possess her. As Kathleen finds herself yielding to his skillfully erotic seduction, only one question remains. Can she keep from surrendering her heart to the most dangerous man she's ever known? So, so yeah, got this one. Um, I did not get the rest of this series, because there's several of them. And since I was going with some other series, I thought I would hold off on this one for now. Um, but I at least have the first one to start, you know, that I found at a thrift store. So it works. It works out nicely. The next two are from the Dragon Riders of Pern series by Anne McCaffrey. I have a bunch of them that my stepdad had given me when I was a kid. They were his. Um... And so I'm trying to kind of fill in the rest of the series. That way, when I'm ready, I can read it. Because I remember trying to read them as a kid, but they were a little bit over my head. Like, they were too advanced for me at the time. And so I always wanted to reread them now that I'm an adult. Um, and so I'm trying to fill in the blanks, and that way I can just read it through. So first we got The Dolphins of Pern. So there's this one. And then we have um, the Renegades of Pern as well. So these are later in the series. Like I think one of these is book 10. Um, and then the other one's like 11 or 12. I can't actually remember. So happy to have those as well. Then we got three hardbacks. So the first one is Unbroken by Laura Hillenbrand. This is a World War II story of survival, resilience, and redemption. And this is actually um, a true story. So this is nonfiction. But it says, on a May afternoon in 1943, an Army Air Force 
Forces bomber crashed into the Pacific Ocean and disappeared, leaving only a spray of debris and a slick of oil, gasoline, and blood. Then on the ocean surface, a face appeared. It was that of a young lieutenant, the plane's bombardier, who was struggling to a life raft and pulling himself aboard. So began one of the most extraordinary odysseys of the Second World War. The lieutenant's name was Louis Zamperini. In boyhood, he had been a cunning and incorrigible delinquent, breaking into houses, brawling, and fleeing his home to ride the rails. As a teenager, he had channeled his defiance into running, discovering a prodig prodigious talent that had carried him to the Berlin Olympics and within sight of the four minute mile. But when war had come, the athlete had become an airman, embarking on a journey that led to his doomed flight, a tiny raft, and a drift to the unknown. Ahead of Zamperini lay thousands of miles of open ocean, leaping sharks, a foundering raft, thirst and starvation, enemy aircraft, and beyond, a trial even greater. Driven to the limits of endurance, Zamperini would answer desperation with ingen ingen ingenuity, suffering with hope, resolve, and humor. Brutality with rebellion. His fate, whether triumphant or tragedy, would be suspended on the fraying wire of his will. In a long-awaited new book, Laura Hill Hillenbrand writes with the same rich and vivid narrative voice she displayed in Sea Biscuit, telling an unforgettable story of a man's journey into extremity, unbroken as a testament to the resilience of the human mind, body, and spirit. So, um, so yeah, I'm excited to read that at some point. And then we have this one, um, Orphan Monster Spy by Matt Killen, Killing. Uh, so yeah, really excited to have this one too. It sounds fun. Germany, 1939. After her mother is shot at checkpoint, 15-year-old Sarah finds herself on the run from a government that wants to see her along with every other Jew dead. Then she meets a mysterious man who needs Sarah to pull off a spy mission he can't attempt on his own infiltrate a boarding school attended by the daughters of Nazi top brass, befriend the girl whose father is a high-ranking scientist, and find the blueprints to a bomb that could destroy the cities of Western Europe. With years of training from her actress mother in the art of impersonation, Sarah thinks she's ready, but nothing prepares her for the cut her cutthroat schoolmates, and soon she's embroiled in a battle for survival unlike any she'd ever imagined, and fighting to hold on to her true self. So, um... Yeah, this should be a fun one as well. And then we have Heart of the West by Penelope Williamson. And this cover just caught my attention. Like, I think that's so pretty. Um, and so this one, it says, All her life, Clementine Kennicutt has been filled with restless longing. A lady like New Englander, she yearns to escape the chafing authoritarian rule of her pious, unforgiving father. Clementine has never met anyone remotely like Gus McQueen. So when the cowboy with laugh laughing eyes and big urgent dream presses her to elope with him to his Montana ranch, she is ready. But nothing has prepared her for the harsh real realities of frontier life or for the unpredictable hankering of the heart. Least of all for the fact that almost from the first moment uh, she sets eyes on Zach, Gus's dashing um, do-well brother, she knows he's the one she was destined to love. Possessed of a rare spirit and courage, Clementine determines not to let the frontier defeat her as she strives for happiness and fulfillment within her fragile marriage. Breaking the local taboos, Clementine becomes friends with Erlen, a young Chinese mail-order bride, and with Hannah, the local dance hall owner, and champions a proud embittered half-breed castle wrestler and his young Indian wife against an angry community that wants to hang him. On a vast canvas dotted with memorable characters and one rousing adventure after another, shoot up storms, a mine explosion, and an attack by a rabid wolf, Penelope Williamson has created an irresistible work of fiction that combines the heroic and gritty appeal of such Western classics as Lonesome Dove and Streets of Laredo, with the romantic enchantment of the thorn birds. So, yeah, sounds right up my alley. Really excited to have that one. So those are the first set of books from the little church thrift store. So can I get them back down here? So the next set is a little bit more. Um, and, yeah, so let's start with these ones because it's a... All right, so we'll start with these ones because it's a, a whole stack. 
um, of the Ice Planet Barbarian books. Um, so I read book number one. I found it at the thrift store for 50 cents. And the people that talk about it seemed to really enjoy it. And I wasn't sure it was going to be my thing. Um, but I thought, you know, I'll give it a try. And it was one of my 24 Days of Book Miss books. I ended up loving it. Like, not so much, um, like, the spice aspect of it. But I actually was really interested in kind of the characters and the story part of the book as well. Um, and so... And I really enjoyed the writing, like it was super light and easy, and so I got a whole stack of other ones. Um, they're not all, they didn't have number two, um, four, six, <laughs> so those ones I kind of got skipped, but I got three, five, seven, eight, nine, um, they didn't have ten, so I got eleven, twelve, didn't have thirteen, and then they had fourteen and fifteen, and then there's some after these as well, so... Got that whole stack there, but basically these women get abducted by aliens and they're going to be um, sold off. It's kind of like alien trafficking, but then the alien ship um, kind of breaks down and so they get dropped on this ice planet and the aliens leave them and plan on returning to for them later. Um, and in the first book, she you know, she's, like, in the best shape out of all of them, and so she kind of goes exploring and meets the alien, um, and then brings him back to the ship with some of his people to save the other girls, so, um, but just the atmosphere, like, of the ice planet, I really enjoyed, um, and I really like the characters, like, these women, so one of the thrift books I ordered has to do with the series as well because I'm particularly interested in that character. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I really liked her in the in the first book as well. So, um, so there's that one. Then we have Millennium by Tom Holland, um, and I believe this is like like religious history. So it says in AD 900, few would have guessed that the splintering kingdoms of Europe were candidates for future greatness. Hemmed in by implacable enemies and an ocean, there were many who feared that they were nearing the time when the Antichrist would appear, heralding the world's end. Instead, there emerged a new civilization. It was the age of Otto the Great and William the Conqueror, of Viking sea kings, of hermits, mo hermits monks, and serfs. It witnessed the spread of castles, the invention of knight knighthood, and the founding of a papal monarchy. It was a momentous achievement, for there was nothing less than the for this was nothing less than the founding of the modern West. So I don't know, it just the cover seemed interesting and it just kinda of sounded interesting to me. So I got that one. And then this is one I have never read, even though it's a classic. Um and I was <clears throat> excuse me, I have froggies. I was definitely interested in reading it this coming year. Um, for Halloween, and so that's Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, of course, so, um, so yeah, I'm really excited that I found this, because I was gonna order it anyway, so that was, that was handy. Then I got some, uh, books that are based on movies or, t or movies or TV shows were based on, um, so first is The Woman in the Window by A.J. Finn, I watched this one on Netflix, I believe, and actually really enjoyed it, so I thought I would enjoy reading it. So, it isn't paranoia if it's really happening. Anna Fox lives alone in a recluse in her New York City home, unable to venture outside. She spends her days drinking wine, maybe too much, watching old movies, recalling happier times, and spying on her neighbors. Then the Russells move into the house across the way. A father, a mother, their teenage son. The perfect family, but when Anna, gazing out her window one night, sees something she shouldn't, her world begins to crumble, and its, sho its shocking secrets are laid bare. What is real? What is imagined? Who is in danger? Who is in control? In this diabolically gripping thriller, no one and nothing is what it seems. So, um, yeah, I'm excited to give that a read. Uh, it should be pretty interesting. And then I also got Gone Girl by Jillian Flynn. Um, so I had hauled one other Jillian Flynn, I think Dark Places or something like that, um, and saw this and thought, you know what, why not? <laughs> so this one, on a warm summer morning in North 
Carthage, Missouri. It is Nick and a Amy Dunn's fifth wedding anniversary. Presents are being wrapped and reservations are being made when Nick's clever and beautiful wife disappears. As the police begin to investigate, the town golden boy parades a series of lies, deceits, and inappropriate behavior. Nick is oddly evasive and he's definitely bitter, but is he really a killer? Uh, and I've never seen the movie, but excited to give the book a try and try that author because I've never read that author either. So then we have three more. So the first one, again, just kind of a cover by called Rainwater by Sandra Brown. Um, and the premise does sound like something I would enjoy as well. The year is 1934 with the country in the stranglehold of drought and economic depression. Ella Barron runs her Texas boarding house with an efficiency that assures her life will be kept in balance. Between chores of cooking and cleaning for her residents, she cares for her 10-year-old son, Solly, a sweet but challenging child whose misunderstood behavior finds Ella on the receiving end of pity, derision, and suspicion. When David Rainwater arrives at the house looking for lodging, he becomes... He comes recommended by a trusted friend as a man of impeccable character, but Ella senses that admitting Mr. Rainwater will bring about unsettling changes. However, times are hard, and in order to make ends meet, Ella's house must remain 100% occupied. So Mr. Rainwater moves into her house and impacts her life in ways Ella could never have foreseen. Um, it goes on, but I'm going to stop there. So, so yeah, there's that one. And then we got this one, which just the name of it, I was like, and then reading it, I think I might enjoy this one. It's called The Book Woman of Troublesome Creek by Kim Michelle Richardson. Um, and I like the cover, the blue on it. I thought that was pretty cool. So this one says, the folks of Troublesome Creek have to scrap for everything. Everything except books, that is. Thanks to Roosevelt's Kentucky Pack Horse Library Project, Troublesome's got its very own traveling librarian, Cussie Mary Carter. Cussie's not only a bookwoman, however, she's also the last of her kind. Her skin is shade of blue unlike most anyone else. Not everyone is keen on Cussie's family or the government's new book program, and along her treacherous route, Cussie faces doubters at every turn. If Cussie wants to bring the joy of books to the complex and hard-scrabble Kentuckians, she's going to have to confront the dangers and prejudices as old as the Appalachians. Uh, Appalachians. The, and suspicion as deep as the holler. Inspired by the true blue-skinned people of Kentucky and the brave and dedicated Kentucky Pack Horse Library Service of the 1930s, The Bookwoman of Troublesome Creek is the story of raw courage, fierce strength, and one woman's belief that books can carry us anywhere, even back home. So, um, yeah, that one seems like, like something I'll enjoy. And then lastly, um, I haven't read this author yet. I did Hall Outlander. Because it's always been one I've been interested in reading. Um, and then I just saw this one, so I picked it up, even though it's way later in the series, and I'll have to fill in in between. It's written in my own heart's blood by Diana Gabaldon, um, which is, I think, book eight of the Heartlander series. Um, they're so chunky, which is part of the reason why I'm kind of hesitating starting the, the, the series. But yeah, I got this one as well, so... There is, that's it for the little church thrift store. Just put these back down. So if the dogs get up, they don't knock them over. Because they'll do that for sure. Um, so yeah, so those are the books that I got from there. And now we'll go ahead and go into the books from um, the used bookstore yesterday. Uh, so I ended up listen, listening to A Christmas Carol on audio. The narrator was Tim Curry, and it was so enjoyable. Uh, and this is another one I had planned to try to get a physical copy this year, so next Christmas I could read it. I've never read A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, um, and so I found this. It's Christmas stories and reprinted pieces, um, and it is, it's old, so it is kind of the spines kind of falling apart, um, but yeah, I found this and I was like, perfect, and then I'll have a copy, uh, and it has other stories in it as well, but I really enjoyed the audio, and I think it's going to be one that I'm going to listen to year after year, because just his narration was so perfect, um, and so yeah, it has a Christmas carol, the chimes, the cricket on the hearth, and the battle of life, 
Um, and then it has additional Christmas stories. The Haunted Man, Somebody's Luggage, Mrs. Ripper's Lodging, um, Mrs. Ripper's Legacy, Dr. Marigold, Two Ghost Stories, The Boy at Mugby, and Seven Poor Travelers. And then it has a bunch of reprinted pieces. Um, so, so yeah, I have I have this now. Um, and I might try to find like a newer version of Just a Christmas Carol. That's maybe a little bit easier to read, but I kind of like the age on this one as well. So there was that one. And then this one I already had. I hauled it from Thrift Books, um, but I just, I'm not really happy with it. So it's Thunderhead by Neil Schusterman. And I don't mind the tabs. Those I can easily remove. But the annotations uh, in here is done by a kid. And they're just, they're just really, really messy. Like, that one's not even the worst one. Um, but, like, a lot of them are, like, through the words. Um, and just, like, the messy handwriting that's kind of large and such. So, um, yeah, I just wasn't very, like, this one right here. You can see it's going through the words there. So, um, so yeah, I just kind of was bugging me. So, this one's actually going to get donated. And I found one at... The used bookstore, so I went ahead and picked it up. The other ones I got from um, the other one, the Toll, I got from Thrift Books, and it came in good condition. Um, and then I got Gleanings actually a, a while back um, when it very first came out, like it was the day it came out. I had stopped at the used bookstore, and they had it because they do have like a little news section as well. Um, and so I have the whole collection and I'm actually reading this in January, which will be so much fun. So I'm glad to have a nicer copy now. And like I said, I'll, I'll donate that one. Um, and somebody who maybe doesn't mind as much or it can go to another kid. Um, you know, what, whatever the case may be. And then I had called like way, 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 way back. Um, I had hauled the second book in the series. And so I saw all this and I was like, you know what? I want to start with the first book um and so I might as well get it and that's the mysterious Benedict Society by Trenton Lee Stewart so this is obviously a newer copy because it has the Disney original series on it um and so yeah I'm excited to have the first in the series so I can start at the beginning it says when this peculiar are you a gifted child looking for special opportunities when this peculiar ad appears in the newspaper dozens of children enroll to take a series of mysterious mind-bending tests and you dear reader can test your witch right alongside them but in the end just four very special children will succeed they're challenged to go on a secret mission that only the most intelligent and resourceful children could compete com could complete with their newfound friendships at stake will they be able to pass the most important test of all so um so yeah Excited to have the first one, and then, like I said, I already have the second one, and I'll work on getting the others as I go along. So, there's that one. Um, and then, let's see. So, I guess we'll start with Lisa Claypiss. Um, so, uh, B had given me a list of titles that were among her favorite, and then I also got some that kind of went along within those same series. Um, so first we have, um, let's see here. We'll start with this one, I guess. So this is the Hathaways series, I believe. Um, if I'm remembering right, I can't quite remember. It doesn't say here. So uh, anyway, I'll put the name just in case. But so first is, again, the magic, um, which she said that this is one of her favorites, even though it is a little bit more spicy than some of the others. Uh, and so, yeah, we have that one. Um, and this one, let's see here. This one's kind of like, because it says zero out of the series. Um, so I won't read the synopsis on this one. But then we have um, Secrets of a Summer Night, which I just like all these titles. So... So this one's four young ladies enter London society with one common goal. They must use their feminine wit and wiles to find a husband. So a daring husband hunting scheme is born. Um, so yeah, that sounds fun. And 
B is always talking about the step back. So the first one didn't have one, but this one does. Uh, so we have that. And then we have it happened one autumn. So there's this one. And again, step back, which I'm not, I don't really care either way if it has a step back or not. But um, I know, like I said, B always talks about this beautiful step back. So the next one is one she also recommended, and that's Devil in Winter. Um, so this is one of her favorites. And then we have Scandals in Spring, which unfortunately this one does not have the step back. Um, but that's okay. And so there's that one. And then we have, um, or no, these are the, the Wallflower series. Sorry, I was mistaken. Um, the, the other one is the half lace, but, and then we have a Wallflower Christmas. So, um, this one does have a step back. So that's, that's pretty, but yeah, so there's that series. And then I think this is the Hathaway one. Um, and so they had the first one. They did have, I think, the second one as well, but it wasn't in very good shape. Um, and then B had recommended the fourth one. So um, this one, this is the Hathaways, and it's Mine Till Midnight. So there's this one. And again, for B, the step back. <laughs> and then... Um, this is the fourth one and it's, I like the cover for this one. It's Married by Morning and there's, there we go. So there's that one. And then I did not have the last book in the Friday Harbor series. So I went ahead and picked that up, which is Crystal Cove. Um, and like I said, we already read the first one, which is Christmas Eve at Friday Harbor, um, or in Friday Harbor. And then the other one is republished as Christmas with Holly. Um, and we're going to be reading Rain Shadow Road, which is the second one in January. Um, and then, like I said, I'll now have the complete set because I already had the third one. And then I got this one now. So there's that one. So that's all the Lisa Claypiss books. Um, so, yeah, I got the three. I finished off Friday Harbor series. Got two of the Hathaway series and then the Wallflower series, um, which is perfect. And I'm excited to get those put away uh, and set up. Um, but yeah, this is, I'm excited because I really enjoyed um, Christmas Eve and Friday Harbor. Like I, I, I really enjoyed that one. It was a bit shorter, so it wasn't as fleshed out. But I'm excited to try some of the historical romances from this author. Um, and so there's that. So next up, let me kind of move it over here where it's a little easier. So I've been working on my Irish Johansson collection. Um, and so, yeah, now I have, now I'm current minus one, which I ordered from Thrift Books, um, of her, like, romantic suspense or mystery, like, suspense books or thriller suspense books. Um, I'm current on, like, all the standalones and, like, all her her Eve Duncan series is now current. Um, the Kendra Michael series is going to be current, and so I'm I'm current up to date. There's two more coming out in 2023, um, and then I don't have all of her backlist like romances. Um, so those I'm not current on, and those I'm not as like interested in fully collecting I mean I would like to have all our works but those ones are like if I come across them great um but I'm not as like anxious to get those I really just wanted her like suspense books um and such so that's what I I did so first we have let's see where are these so I had gotten I think it's called final target um, which is a uh, part of a series called the Wind Dancer series. Uh, and there's four books in that. That was the fourth book. So I was looking to get those. And it's kind of interesting. I got Final Target because I thought it was like, a, which it is, um, one of her like more suspense books. But the, the first ones in the series aren't quite like that. So I'm not really sure how they all tie together. The first one's called The Wind Dancer. 
Um, and this one has a step back too. <laughs> so, but it says Renaissance Italy, where intrigues were as intricate as carved cathedral doors and affairs of state were ruled by affairs of the bedchamber, where the wrestling riches of silk hid the quick glint of deadly stilettos and poison vied with port as a favored drink to offer guests. From the spellbinding pen of Irish Johansson comes her most lush, dramatic, and emotionally touching romance yet, the captivating story of the lovely and indomitable slave Sanchia and the man who bought her on the back street in Florence. Passionate, powerful condottier Lionel, Lionello Andreas would love Sanchia and endanger her with equal wild abandon as he sought to win back the prized possession of his family, the Wind Dancer. So, I haven't, I've read, like, one of her, like, romances, which I didn't realize at the time. Like, I just saw Irish Johansson and picked it up. And it, it was pretty good. It was okay. Um, but this sounds interesting, so I'm really excited to read that. And then we have uh, Storm Winds. Which, again, very shiny. And, again, step back. So, in this one, you have 18th century France, where cunning intellects and glittering gowns conceal treacherous hearts. Where madness swept a nation, and the last sound many noblemen heard was the terrible song of the guillotine's blade. Brilliant and repeatedly ruthless in business, Jane Mark Andreas is haunted by the exquisite statue of the Wind Dancer, the heritage of his family. Um, he will defy any force of man or nature to get back. Juliet de Clement is a, is a force of nature, a beautiful woman who will discover the firestorms of passion denied her by a cruel world. Both want the Wind Dancer. Both are determined to wrest it from the hands of unyielding royalty. Together they will risk everything to get it. Their quest taking them from stormy Paris to tranquil gardens of southern France to the perilous mountains of Spain. And their passion for each other will grow to consume them as they are now consumed by their obsession for the Wind Dancer. So, huh, this series sounds really interesting. And then the third one in the series is Reap the Wind. Um, and so this is more like modern day, you can see. Um, and so some would kill to know what Caitlin Vassaro knows. For the secrets she's kept hidden all her life are the kind that the rich and powerful will do anything to possess. Yet not even Caitlin knows how much danger she is in or how far some will go to hunt her down. But she is about to find out when she enters a business deal with the mysterious and charismatic Alex Karazov. And joins the hunt for one of the world's most coveted treasures, the Wind Dancer. So, it sounds like, you know, the Wind Dancer, I was wondering how it connected, like, those are more historical pieces and then into her more modern day um, suspense book. So, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited for those. Um, and then I had gotten, I didn't realize it at the time, um, so this is not part of the haul. This, I just, I had it out. But it's the Sedekin series, and there's 18 of these books. And I had pulled up this one, which is number six in the series, uh, and didn't realize it. And so when I was organizing and such, I was like, oh, I gotta get this. So I got the other, the first five in the series. Um, and so first we have, well, that's not, that's not it. Sorry. So first we have the Golden Barbarian. Um, so again, these are more of like her historical, I'm not dropping everything, historical romance books and for B, another step back. <laughs> so, uh, and so this one from the halls of a pal pal palatial prison to the hot sands of an endless desert. Here is a timeless story of love and adventure set among hills of gold, warring tribes, and fable, fabled kingdoms. The story of a fearless princess and a barbarian sheik. She was a ravishing pawn in a game of politics and passion, flaunting the oppressive destiny decreed for her by the kingdom of Tamrovia. Princess Teresa Christina Rubinoff struck a sensual bargain with a handsome barbarian chieftain. She vowed to play his seductive game, surrendering herself to his will, all the while determined to fight for her independence in a land that considered women as only only as playthings. He was a desert warrior king, driven by passion and pride. Mysterious as the desert knight, rich as Midas, Galen Ben Rashid, 
swept Hess away to his palace in exotic Sidekin, offering her freedom in exchange for the marriage that would join their kingdoms. A man surrounded by enemies, he would make her a slave to his passion in order to bind her to his side, little knowing that when he took the captivating princess as his bride, he would lose his heart. So, there is the first one in the series. And then the next one is um, The Golden Valkyrie. Uh, a daring young woman is about to discover the riskiest business of all. So this one is more, again, like her suspense ones. Um, so it's kind of nice how, as she's kind of evolved in her writing, she's carried on the series and they've evolved with her. But when P.I. Honey Winston is hired to steal incriminating letters from a visiting dignitary Prince Rubinoff, she's prepared for a dangerous mission that could end her career. But when she blows her cover, she finds the amused prince is every everything the media have made him out to be. Part Adonis, part Playboy, and irresistibly charismatic. The problem is the feeling is mutual. Intrigued, the prince is determined to keep his gorgeous young trespasser by his side as long as possible. So there's that. And then the next one, the third one, is Trustworthy Redhead. So billionaire Alex Ben Rashid can't remember the last time he heard the word no. As Houston's economic powerhouse and heir to a vast oil-rich Middle East Eastern sheikdom, Alex is used to getting what he wants. And when he lays his eyes on Sabrina, the sensuous red-haired, redhead ha hired, <laughs> redhead hired, to belly dance for his party, he wants her, and immediately sets out to possess her heart and soul. But it's clear that his virile and arrogant manner will never win him Sabrina's heart. Could Alex ever be humble enough to sway her? So it looks like it's this family. Um, and then the next one is Capture the Rainbow. And so this one is gorgeous Hollywood stunt double Kendra Michaels is fighting for the job of her life. High, a high-paying, high-risk jump that will clear the debt on her brother's medical bills. Casey Michaels was a stuntman himself until the job went tragically wrong. Now Kendra is prepared to take the same chance. There's just one man standing in her way, a man whose irresistible magnetism seduced her in ways she never experienced and never before surrendered to. Director Joel Damon gets what he wants, and he wants Kendra, but the explosive attraction he feels at the mere sight of her is entirely new to him, and it hasn't disappeared, not since their one unforgettable night together, and not since Joel discovered she wasn't the experienced starlet he mistaken her for. Now he's determined to extend that night into many more, but he'll have to keep Kendra alive to do it, even if it ruins her career, for he has bigger plans in mind for her than she ever imagined. So I'm not really sure how this ties in um, to the Sedekin, but we'll, we'll find out once we read it. And then this one is Touch the Horizon. Um, and so she was stranded in a deadly sandstorm when he rode it to her rescue like a desert prince on his black stallion. On a lark, Billy Callahan had come to the Middle East to play a minor film role. So maybe the film aspect ties it in. Um, in a desert epic. Suddenly she found herself starting in a real life romantic adventure. Cowboy hero, friend of the Sheik and princes, David Bradford spoke like a poet in the drawl of his native Texas. What was this mysterious, eccentric, and irresistibly seductive man doing in the Sedekin, and what did he want with an ordinary woman like Billy? Her curiosity peaked. Billy followed David to the lavish pleasure fortress he called home with his armed guards and adoring staff. He warned her that the pleasure he offered would last forever. What he didn't know was that Billy only believed in now. So... Ah, so yeah, it sounds like it kind of combines like the the royalty and then the movie business together. So, um, then the rest of these minus one, which I don't know where it is, so we'll just have to find it. The rest of these are standalones, and there is one that's like a novella that goes with the Eve Duncan series that I didn't have. Um, but we'll have to find it. So, let's see. So first is a hardback, and this is a newer one. It's called High Stakes. Um, so Logan Tanner, and this one might be a series. It says it's the Logan Tanner series, but there's no books projected to come out in the series after this one yet. So we'll, we'll just have to see. But 
Logan Tanner lives the exhilarating life of a professional gambler, taking risk with nerves of steel. From casinos in Macau to Monte Carlo to Milan, he's racked up a fortune and become a living legend. But all the glitz and glamour hide a dark and violent past as an extractor, a world that comes rushing back to him when the beautiful and innocent Laura Balkan enters his life. Soon Logan is drawn into the conflict between two Russian mafia bosses over Laura, whose life now hangs in the balance. Logan has been offered something more valuable to him than money, information he desperately needs in exchange for getting Laura out of Russia and into safety. Once together, Tanner discovers that Laura is a force to be reckoned with in her own right. Tanner's search for the truth leads them to the bright lights of Las Vegas, where the person who was hunting Laura now lies in wait for them. As the stakes climb with each deadly confrontation, Logan and Laura are catapulted into a game against pure evil. The odds are stacked against them, but it's a game they know they must play, even if it costs them their lives. So, yeah, that should be a fun one. Excited for that. This one, I love the cover. Um, and it's called Chaos. And I, love, I just like the horse. So, and it looks like there's like a fire or something. But when CIA agent Alyssa Flynn flaunts the rules by breaking into a mansion in the middle of the night, she skillfully circumvents alarms and outwits guards, only to find herself standing in billionaire Gabe Corgan's study, busted by Corgan himself. This could cost her a job unless, in a split second, she could turn the tables and try to convince him to join her on the most important mission of her life. In a ripped from the headlines plot, schoolgirls in Africa have been kidnapped, and Alyssa knows that Corgan has the courage, financial means, and high-tech weaponry to help rescue them. With so many innocent lives hanging in the balance, what she doesn't reveal is that one of those schoolgirls is like a little sister to her. But when the truth gets out, the stakes grow even higher. Calling in additional assistance from renowned horse whisperer Margaret Douglas, Alyssa and Gabe lay their plans, only to see them descend into chaos as the line between right and wrong wavers before them like a mirage. Every path is strewn with pitfalls, each likely to get them or the hostages killed, but with the help of a brave team and a horse with the heart of a warrior, they might just get out of this alive. So I love anything horses, so this one should be fun. So these, these types of books, the suspense books, are the ones I really enjoy by her. Um, but like I said, I am interested in collecting some of her like romance novels as well. This one is called Nowhere to, No One to Trust. Again, a standalone. And trained as a sniper by the military, Elena doesn't need anyone to survive. But now she finds herself on the run from one dangerous man and turning for help to another. Sean Galen was a man without illusions. He knew it was only desperation that caused Elena to accept his help. A mother's desperation to save her young son from a psychopath. Soon a trail of horrifying murders will follow them across the country to a shattering showdown. Here a master killer plans for Elena to commit the ultimate act of betrayal. Oh, excuse me. Only then will he take the one thing she'll have left to give. Her life. So, can't trust anyone. And then this one is And Then You Die. So there's this one. Best Grady has heard the unmistakable sound before. She knows what it means, but not even the eerie lament of the howling dogs can prepare her for what has taken place in a small village. The seasoned photojournalist has been sent here on an easy assignment, and now she has stumbled upon something she was never meant to see. Amid the chaos and fear, she joins forces with an intimidating stranger, a man whose alliances are unclear but whose methods have a way of leaving bodies in his wake. For what she has witnessed is only the first stage of a, in a plan of terror that may kill us all, and she has no choice but to stop it or die trying. So, yeah, there's that one. And then we got The Ugly Duckling. The brutal attack should have killed anybody, but Nell Calder did more than survive. She emerged a woman transformed with an exquisite beauty only found in fairy tales. Nell Calder deserved a happy ending. Instead, her descent into terror has just begun. Her attacker is still on... There's kind of a sticker on the in the way. But he's still on the loose and determined to finish what he's started. So, there's that. And then... Okay, so this is the Eve Duncan. It's not really a novella, though. But it's, like, not part of, like, the main series. So it's, like, 4.5. Um, and it's called Dead Aim. 
Uh, and this one, a celebrated photojournalist, Alex Graham, has recorded some of the world's most tragic and heartbreaking stories. But her latest assignment has forced her to her across a dangerous line. At a dam collapse in Arapahoe Junction, Colorado, Alex witnesses a conspiracy that will shock a nation. If she can stay alive long enough to reveal the truth, for the collapse of the Arapahoe Dam was not an accident. The official story is just a cover-up for a truth so frightening, so unthinkable, that Alex must be silenced forever. Her only ally is Jed Morgan, an ex-covert -co commando with a checkered past and a team of assassins at his heels. Now she's marked for death by an enemy who never got, who never misses, never forgives, never gives up, and who's already got her center dead aim. So that completes the Eve Duncan um, up to this point anyway. And then we have Long After Midnight, which is another standalone. The first warning was triggered hundreds of miles away. The second warning exploded only yards from where she and her son stood. Now Kate Denby realizes the frightening truth. She's somebody's target. Danger has arrived in Kate's backyard with a vengeance, and the gifted scientist is awakening to a nightmare nightmare world where a ruthless killer is stalking her, where her innocent son is considered expendable, and where her medical research to which she has devoted her life is the same research that could get her killed. Her only hope of protecting her family and making the met that medical breakthrough is to elude her enemy until she can face him on her own ground, on her own terms, and destroy him. So, that's fun. And then this one is Firestorm. And now... For Carrie Murphy, the inferno was never far away. The flames of a long-ago nightmare still burn in her memory. The heat, the choky smoke, the helplessness. She can never run fast enough. Now Carrie works as an arson investigator with her evidence-sniffing dog, Sam. Together, they're a great team, but Carrie's life is about to change in the time it takes to strike a match. Who is Silver? And why has the mysterious operative chosen her in the desperate race to find a killer determined to ignite hell on Earth? Even together, Carrie and Silver may not have a chance against a psychopath as cold-hearted as his method is red-hot. There's only one chance to save themselves and the innocent lives at stake. Carrie will have to reach deep into a past that already came close to destroying her once. She will have to do what she hopes she never, she never have to, fight fire with fire. So, that should be a fun one. Always like a dog, so. And two more from this what I have physically. This one's The Perfect Witness. When Teresa Casali was young, she discovered she had a strange gift, the ability to read people's memories. But the gift seemed more like a curse when her mob boss father used her to gain the upper hand in his world of corruption and violence. Exposed by her own family to the darkest impulse of mankind, Teresa is alone and unprotected. She realizes that if she's to survive, she has to run. Out of nowhere, or so she believes, a man by the name of Andre Mandic appears. He kills her pursuers, but that's not nearly enough to make Teresa trust him. It is his promise to get her into witness protection, along with his mind-blowing ability to help her control her gift before it consumes her, that convinces Teresa Casali to become Ali Girard. Living a normal life with a new family, she shuts the door on to the past. Although Mandic is clear, when the time is right, he too will benefit from her powers. So, that sounds really interesting. That should be a fun one. And then we have No Easy Target. So Margaret Douglas has worked hard to put her painful past behind her. Raised off the grid in an abusive home, her only escape was near the nearby forest in which she sought refuge whenever she could. There, in the peaceful woods, she discovers a strange gift, the ability to understand animals and to communicate with them. And so those creatures become her only friends, her only joy during a desolate childhood. Now Margaret wants nothing more than to live a quiet life, close to the animals and under the radar. But her abilities have not gone unnoticed, and there are those who would use them for their own purposes. Determined not to be a pawn in anyone's game, every time someone gets too close, Margaret uproots her life and outruns them. When John Lassiter breaks into Margaret's apartment, she vanishes again. But Lassiter has good reason to be persistent. As a CIA operative, he owes his life to his men, one of whom is being held captive by an unrelenting enemy, an enemy who has set his sights on Margaret, which means that Lassiter must control her to use her as bait. So, 
That's fun. So yeah, those are the Irish Johansson books. And then we did, like I said, I did a thrift books order just to kind of fill in the blanks. So I did get book two in the um, Ice Planet Barbarian series, which is Barbarian Alien. And again, those are by Ruby Dixon because uh, that's the character I'm particularly interested in. They also had book four, but it was like $15. Um, and so, and it wasn't new. It was it was used, so I was like, eh, I'll hold off on that one because I'm not as interested as going to read the synopsis, and that character wasn't one I was, like, as interested in, but um, Liz is the character in the second book, and I definitely wanted to read her. So, got that one. Then Blink of an Eye, which is the eighth book in the Kendra Michael series by Irish Johansson and her son Roy Johansson. Um, they collabed on most of the books in that series. And so that was the last one I was missing and I just haven't been able to find it. So it's like, I'm just going to have to order that one. And then we got three more Lisa Claypiss. So these are the ones that are in the Hathaway series. Um, Cause like I said, I got the first one and then the fourth one. Um, so I was missing the others. So we got Seduce Me at Sunrise, uh, which is the second one. Then we got Tempt Me at Twilight, which is the third one. And Love Me in the Afternoon, which is the fifth one. So we got all of those coming as well. Um, and then I did earn a free book. So I am going to do one more book. I just don't know what I'm going to get yet. Um, and so, yeah, I know this is already really, really long. But I'll be back with the books I got from Christmas here. Like, you'll be a second for you guys. Um, and then we'll wrap this video up. And that will be what... I'm ending the year with, which is so much fun. So I'll be right back. All right. We are the day after Christmas and I have my Christmas haul here. So definitely going to be going over that real quick. I hope if you celebrated, you had a wonderful holiday. Um, and if you didn't, you just had a great day. But yeah, we got a lot of books to uncover. I got very, very spoiled this year. Like so overwhelmed by it um definitely very amazing my husband and my in-laws were fantastic but before we get into those i do have a few more books from thrift books because after my last order i had earned a free book and um a book that's been on my wish list that's kind of hard to get a hold of especially in the u.s cover edition came available as well so i did that order and so I got three books to kind of fill in the gaps of the Dragon Rider of Pern series by Anne McCaffrey. Um, I had some gaps in between. And then there's obviously a bunch after the point where I'm at um, as far as the books I have. But I got Narilka's Story, Dragon Drums, and Dragon's Dawn. So that will fill in the gaps and then I'll just have to collect on from there. But I can at least maybe start reading the series now because um, I won't have those gaps in there. And then the one that's been kind of hard to get a hold of, especially with the U.S. cover edition, is Amy's Journal, which is a special edition of the Heartland books. I have all the others, the main series and the special editions except that one. And I found some, like I found one on eBay, one on Amazon, used obviously, but they were the other cover edition, which I don't particularly like those covers. I really wanted the U.S. ones that matches what I already have. And so it came available on thrift books. And it was also the cheapest that I found as well. So I went ahead and snagged it. Um, and the, that series is by Lauren Brooke. So I'm really, really happy I'll have that. And then I'll have the whole Heartland collection. Um, minus there are some that continue in French, which I have no interest in in those. So, um, so yeah, there's that one. And then because of that order, I ended up getting another free book. So I decided to go ahead and get that as well. Um, and just that way I have all these books coming at once. And then I can start the new year fresh and just be good. And so I ended up getting um, A Cosmology of Monsters by Sean Hamill. That one is one I've been really, really interested in. When I've only seen like a few people talk about it, but it definitely caught my attention. And then I got H's for Hawk by Helen McDonald. Um, another one that I've seen actually several people talk about um, or have been putting on their TBR at least. And so I was really interested in getting that one. So I got that. And then I got The Privilege of Youth by Dave Pelzer. Um, 
I have. So it starts off, it's his story, like it's, it's nonfiction about his childhood and such. It starts off with a child called it. He was abused by his mom. Um, and then it goes into the privilege of youth. Um, no, that's this one. The, I forget the middle one, the lost boy or something like that. And then it goes into a man named Dave. Um, so it's just kind of his transition, you know, from being a child who was abused to now being an adult. And I didn't have this one, which is his teenage years. So um, I thought I might as well go ahead and get that because I've been wanting to reread those. I read them as a teenager um, and haven't read them since. So it was a good time to get that so I could reread that. So I have those um, seven books coming and my other thrift book order, which I've already talked about, hasn't arrived yet. Uh, so hopefully that will be here soon as well. Um, but yeah, those are coming. <laughs> now let's go ahead and get in to the books that I got gifted to me this year. So these are all books that I've been really interested in in the past year. Uh, and I just, because they were either newer books or more popular books, um, I haven't been able to find them like at a thrift store and such. Uh, I just haven't picked them up. And so my husband got me a bunch and then my sister-in-law went crazy as well and got me a ton. So, and my sister-in-law also did something else, which was extra special, which I just am so obsessed with. Absolutely love it. So the first two books came from my sister-in-law, uh, and that is Six Crimson Cranes and, um, The Dragon's Promise by Elizabeth Lim. So this is based on a fairy tale. Um, she, her six brothers get turned into cranes and she's not allowed to speak because if she speaks, uh, every time she speaks, one of them dies. Um, and so she kind of goes on this quest to try to break this, this curse. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm really excited to have these. I've wanted these for a really, really long time. Uh, cause I have no doubt I'm going to love them. Now, these covers are all right. I really, <laughs> this is the one time, like, I really wish I could get the UK covers because I think those ones are just so stunning with the colors and everything. But I do like these covers as well. They're just not quite as good. Like, they don't, no, not near as good as the other covers. Um, but still, very, very happy I at least have these books to read now. Very thankful for that. Um, and so, yeah, this is one of the things. So I have two of these. Um, and so she just did a collection of the animal pictures here, um, which is so cute. And you have the cats up there in the corner, which are adorable. Um, and so you got Nidra uh, and Ani and Nidra here in the middle. And then in the flowers, that's Marley um, and Ani sleeping down there in the corner. And so, yeah, those are the cats, which I think that was very nice. And then I think I have Boo Boo. She's not in that one, but a whole collection of my dog Boo Boo in this, in this one. So she's such a, such a ham, but that's Boo Boo. Um, and so, yeah, she, those were nice. And then in the rest of them are bookmarks, which are just adorable so um and then she got me this these are also from my sister-in-law uh two stephen graham joan books um this is an author i've been really really interested in reading and so we have the only good indians and mongrels so she got me both of these i, I just wanted one or the other i didn't really care which one i started with but she got me both which was so nice and so we do also have bookmarks in these um, and so this one is a bunch of, uh, mainly Ani, um, but you also have Ani with Nidra as a baby, Ani with Mar Marley as a baby, Ani and Nidra again, and then, uh, Adeline and Nidra, and then on the back, um, you have Boo Boo and Nidra and Boo Boo and Marley, and it says cuddle up with a good book which is so cute. So there's a bunch of these, like um, each one has several copies of the bookmark. So that's really cute. Uh, and I think this one's the same one. Oh no, this one's a different one. So this one, you have them with a bunch of like bones and you have Marley eating a carrot down there at the bottom. Um, and it says, those who chew together stick together, which I think is just so adorable. 
<laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's a lot of fun. So the only good Indians, a tale of revenge, cultural identity, and the cost of breaking from tradition in this latest novel from the Jordan Peele of horror literature, Stephen Graham Jones. Seamlessly blending classic horror and dramatic narrative with sharp social commentary, The Only Good Indians follows four American Indian men after a disturbing event from their youth puts them in a desperate struggle for their lives. Tracked by an enemy bent on revenge, these childhood friends are helpless as the culture and traditions they left behind catch up to them in a violent and vengeful way. So, really excited to read that one. And then Mongrels, he was born an outsider, like the rest of his family. Poor yet resilient, he lives in the shadows with his Aunt Libby and Uncle Darren, folk who stubbornly make their way in a society that does not understand or want them. They are mongrels, mixed blood, neither this nor that. The boy at the center of mongrels must decide if he belongs on the road with his aunt and uncle, or if he fits with the people on the other side of the tracks. For ten years, he and his family have lived a life of late-night exits and narrow escapes always on the move across the south to stay one ha step ahead of the law. But the, the time is drawing near when Darren and Libby will finally know if their nephew is like them or not. And the close calls they've been running from for so long are catching up fast now. Everything is about to change. So, yeah. <laughs> I love the cover of this one, too. I really like the yellow on it. Uh, and so those are two more that I'm really excited for. Um, and then she got me... Grady Hendrix, which I've never read Grady Hendrix before, so this will be my first one. The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, which this is very, very popular. Um, this author and this book in particular um, are very popular here on BookTube. And this is my favorite bookmark. So it says, Love Has Four Paws. Um, and so you have Nidra and my husband, uh, Nidra and Ani eating ice cream. And then this is Nid uh, Anya as a baby. So it says love has four paws and a boop little snoot. <laughs> like I totally lost it when I saw this. Like, oh my gosh, I absolutely love it. So um, that's my favorite bookmark that she had made. Uh, and this one says Patricia Campbell's life has never felt smaller. Her husband is a workaholic. Her teenage kids have lives, have their own lives. Her senile mother-in-law needs constant care, and she's always a step behind on her endless to-do list. The only thing keeping her sane is her book club, a close-knit group of Charleston women united by their love for true crime. Then James Harris walks into her life during the summer of 1993. He makes her feel things she hasn't felt in years. But when children on the other side of town go missing, Patricia wonders if he's connected. Is he a Brad Pitt, a Bundy, or something much worse? So... I can't wait to read this and see what all the hype is about. Um, yeah, really, really excited for that one. And then, so my husband got one of these and then um, my sister-in-law got the other one. So it's Haunting and Hunting uh, Adeline by H.D. Carlton. And uh, our Calico Cat... Uh, is named Adeline and this is the cat and mouse series so just because of those little things alone I was really interested in this um, and I just I love the covers every time you know somebody talks about them I just love the cover now these ones have very very big trigger warnings I'm not sure if they're gonna be my thing or not um, but I'm definitely intrigued I, it's basically, I think, kind of like a stalker romance, um, but like I said, very, like, a lot of trigger warnings, um, so definitely it's very dark, so keep that in mind, look at the trigger warnings before you go into this, um, but the manipulator, I can manipulate the emotions of anyone who lets me, I will make you hurt, make you cry, make you laugh and sigh, but my words don't affect him, especially not when I plead for him to leave, he's always there watching and waiting, and I can never look away, not when I want him to come closer, the shadow, I didn't mean to fall in love, but now that I have, I can't stay away. I'm memorized by her smile, by her eyes, and the way she moves, the way she undresses. I'll keep watching and waiting until I can make her mine. And when she is, I'll never let her go, not even when she begs me to. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
So yeah, excited to give this series a try, but like I said, I am a little bit nervous about them as well um, because they are so dark and because of the trigger warnings. Um, but even just to have those on my shelves, like I just like the covers and the aesthetic of the book themselves. So then she got me, this is again, my sister-in-law. Um, and so I've never read Adrian Young and I've been really wanting to. And so she got me Fable and then Namesake. Um, and so I'll read these and I am definitely interested in getting spells for forgetting at some point in this next year as well, especially if I enjoy these. Even if I'm not a big fan of these, I still plan on getting that one since that one's, um, an adult and this is YA. Um, I think that definitely makes a difference. So I don't actually know what these are about. I just, <laughs> I remember seeing them and really was interested in them. Um, so it says, welcome to a world made dangerous by the sea and by those who wish to profit from it, where a young girl must find her place and her family while trying to survive in a world built for men. For 17-year-old Fable, the daughter of the most powerful trader in the Narrows, the sea is the only home she has ever known. It's been four years since the night she watched her mother drown during an unforgiving storm. The next day, her father abandoned her on a legendary island filled with thieves and little food. To survive, she must keep to herself learn to trust no one, and rely on the unique skills her mother taught her. The only thing that keeps her going is the goal of getting off the island, finding her father, and demanding her rightful place beside him and his crew. To do so, Fable enlists the help of a young trader named Wes to get her off the island and across the narrows to her father. But her father's rivalries and the dangers of his trading enterprise have only multiplied since she last saw him. And Fable soon finds that Wes isn't who he seems. Together they will have to survive more than the treacherous storms that haunt the Narrows if they're going to stay alive. So, yeah, really, really excited for that one. I've been wanting that one for a very long time. So, <clears throat> excuse me. And then, this is another one from my sister-in-law. Um, and this one is very popular right now. And that's Belladonna by Adeline Grace. So I love this cover and I can't wait to read this. So let's see here. For as long as Signa Faro has been alive, the people in her life have fallen like stars. Orphan as a baby, 19-year-old Signa has been raised by a string of guardians, each more interested in her wealth than her well-being, and each has met an untimely end. Her remaining relatives are the elusive Hawthorns, an eccentric family living in, at Thorn Grove, an estate both glittering and gloomy. This patriarch mourns his late wife through wild, <coughs> excuse me, through wild parties, while his son grapples for control of the family's waning reputation, and his daughter suffers from a mysterious illness. But when their mother restless spirit appears, claiming she was poisoned, Signa realizes that the family she depends on could be in grave danger and enlist the help of a surly stable boy to hunt down the killer. However, Signa's best chance of uncovering the murderer is an alliance with Death himself, a fascinating, dangerous shadow who has never been far from her side. Though he's made her life a living hell, Death shows Signa that their growing connection may be more powerful and more irresistible than she ever dared. So, I love Death as a character in books. So I'm really excited for this one. I don't even know where to start. Like, there's so so many great books. I'm so overwhelmed. <clears throat> That's going to be hard to decide. So, let's see here. And then, the next set's for my husband. This one is the last one from my sister-in-law. Um, this one I know is right up my alley. And it's Robinov by Nadine Brand Brandis. So love 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 the cover of this and it's not a very long book so it should be fun um i have the love bookmark in this one and, and let's see here so this one anastasia romanov was given a single mission to smuggle an ancient spell into her suitcase on her way to exile in siberia it might be her family's only salvation but the leader of the bolshevik army is after them and he's hunted romanov before Nastya's only chances of saving herself and her family are either to release the spell and deal with the consequences or to enlist help from Zash, a handsome soldier who doesn't act like the average Bolshevik. Nastya 
has only dabbled in magic, but doesn't frighten her half as much as her growing attraction to Zash. She likes him. She thinks he might even like her. That is until she's on the side of a firing squad and he's on the other. So excited to read that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got so many froggies in my throat. Probably because we played a lot last night. So I already showed you that bookmark. I was just looking. So these other books are from my husband now. So first up, we have The 10,000 Doors of January by Alex E. Harrell. I read The Once and Future Witches by this author and fell in love. And I've been anxious to read this one ever since. So finally have it now. Um, and this is the other bookmark. I think this is the last one. So it's The Cats. Uh, and then it says Stay Calm and Read On. Uh, which is so cute. I love this one of Fratiline right here with her with her nose right in the camera. And then this is the back. Um, that's little Watson with his... We got him like these bat wings for Halloween one year. Uh, and so that's that's him. So that's the bookmark. Um, but I'm really, really excited for this book. Uh, and it just the premise sounds really interesting as well. As a ward of wealthy Mr. Locke, January Scholar feels little different from the artifacts that decorate his sprawling mansion, carefully maintained, largely ignored, and utterly out of place. But when she finds a strange book, one that tells a tale of secret doors, of love, adventure, and danger, for the first time, January realized she can escape her story and sneak in to someone else's. So, that one is another one I'm just so happy to have. These next two... Um, <clears throat> so I watch, uh, I think it's Ask a Mortician. I'll leave the YouTube channel link down below. Um, but I watch her here on, on YouTube and it's Caitlin Doty. Well, she's also an author, which I didn't know. I've been watching her YouTube channel for ages, but I didn't know she was also an author. And so I was really interested in getting some of her books. And so my husband got me two. He has Smoke's Get, Smoke Gets in Your Eyes. Um, again, by Caitlin Doty, and this one is more like the history of undertaking, which I think is really cool. So it says, armed with a degree in medieval history and a flair for the ma macabre, Caitlin Doty took a job at a crematory and turned a fascination with death into her life's work. She cared for bodies of every color, shape, and affliction and became an intrepid explorer in the world of the dead. In this best-selling memoir, brimming with gallows, humor, and vivid characters, she marvels at the gruesome history of undertaking that relates her unique coming-of-age story with bold curiosity and mordant wit. But a turns hilarious, dark, and uplifting, smoke gets in your eyes, reveals how the fear of dying wraps our society, warps our society, and will make you reconsider how our culture treats the dead. So... Really, really excited for that one, but I'm most excited for this one. <laughs> love the title, Will My Cat Eat My Eyeballs? So, and I love the little cat on the front. I just think that's adorable. Um, and so, yeah, it says, Everyday Funeral Director Caitlin Doty receives dozens of questions about death. The best questions come from kids. What would happen to an astronaut's body if it was pushed out of a space shuttle? Do people poop when they die? Can grandma have a Viking funeral? And will my cat eat my eyeballs? Doty blends her mortician's knowledge of the body and the intriguing history behind common misconceptions about corpses to offer factual, hilarious, and candid answers to 35 distinctive questions posed by her youngest fans. In her inimitable voice, Doty details lore and science of what happens to and inside our bodies after we die. Why do corpses groan? What causes bodies to turn colors during decomposition? And why do hair and nails appear longer after death? Readers will learn the best soil for mummifying your body, whether you can preserve your best friend's school as a keepsake, and what happens when you die on a plane. Beautifully illustrated by Diane Ruse, Will My Cat You Might Rival shows us that death can inspire science and art, and only by asking questions can we begin to embrace it. So... Um, yeah, it has, it has, like, pictures, which are so awesome, and I, I think this is going to be one of the first ones I pick up. I'm going to actually try to sneak it in to my January, uh, TBR, because I just, I love stuff like this, so there's that one, 
And then, let's see, we'll go ahead and do this one. So this one, he isn't one that I particularly wanted. He did, like, the bestseller. He originally did the bestseller from, like, my um, month and year of birth, but I wasn't interested in that one. He was, like, kind of questioning me, and it wasn't something. It was, like, more, like, political, um, and I just wasn't really interested in that. So he did bestseller I think he either did his birth month in my year or something like that or he did his birthday in his birth year but it came up with the Parsifal Mosaic by Rod Robert Ludlum um and I actually have a book by this author on my shelves that somebody gave me and I haven't read it yet so now I have two that I'll need to read but this one does sound like something I would enjoy Michael H Havelock's World died on a moonlight beach in Costa Brava as he watched his partner and lover, lover double agent Jenna Karras efficiently gunned down by his own agency. There's nothing left for him but to quit the game, get out. Then in one frantic moment on a crowded railroad platform in Rome, Havelock sees Jenna. Racing around the globe in search of his beautiful betrayer, Havelock, um, or Havelock is now marked for death by both U.S. and Russian assassins. Trapped in a massive mosaic of treachery created by top-level mole with the world in his fist, Parsifal. So, that one definitely seems like one I would enjoy. Again, these types of books, like, aren't ones that I necessarily gravitate to, but I do tend to really enjoy them when I do pick them up. So, um, he got that on his own. You know, and had different parameters. And then there's just two more series left. Um, and so first is... The Four Horsemen series, uh, which again is kind of more of a darker romance, so I'm not sure how I'm going to like it, um, but I think I'll like this probably better than the Cat and Mouse series. But this is the Four Horsemen series, so book one is Pestilence, then you have War, Famine, and Death. Um, and so this is like dark romance with the four horsemen. So in Pestilence, you have, um, when pe Pestilence comes for Sarah Burns Town, one thing is certain, everyone she knows and loves is marked for death. Unless, of course, the angelic looking horseman is stopped, which is exactly what Sarah has in mind when she shoots the unholy beast off his steed. Too bad no one told her Pestilence can't be killed. Now the horseman, very much alive and very pissed off, has taken her prisoner, and he's eager to make her suffer. Only the longer she's with him, the more uncertain she is about his true feelings towards her and her, her towards him. And now, well, Sarah might still be able to save the world, but in order to do so, she'll have to sacrifice her heart in the process. Then we have War. The day Jerusalem falls, Miriam Elmady knows her life is over, houses are burning, the streets run red with blood, and a treacherous army a traitorous army is massacring every last resident. There is no surviving this, especially not once Miriam catches the eye of war himself. But when the massive and terrifying horseman corners Miriam, he calls her his wife, and instead of killing her, he takes her back to his camp. Now Miriam faces a terrifying future, one where she watches her world burn town by town, and the one man responsible for it all is her seemingly indestructible husband. But there's another side to him, one that is gentle and loving and dead set on winning her over. And she might not be strong enough to resist. However, if there's one thing Miriam has learned, it is that love and war cannot coexist. And so she must make the ultimate choice, surrender to war and watch humankind fall or sacrifice everything and stop him. So I just love the, the covers of these two. Um, and then we have Famine. So, Ana da Silva has always assumed she'd die young. She just never expected it to be at the hands of Famine, the haunting immortal who once spared her life so many years ago. But if the horseman remembered her at all, he must not care, for when she comes face to face with him for a second time in her life, she's stabbed and left for dead. Only she doesn't quite die. If there's one thing Famine is good at is cruelty, and how these blighted bastards deserve it. Try as he might, he cannot forget what they once did to him. But when Anna, a ghost from his past, corners him and promises pain for what he so recently did to her, she and her empty threats captivate him, and he decides to keep her around. In spite of themselves, Anna and Famine are drawn to each other, but at the end of the day, the two are enemies. Nothing changes that. Not one kind of act, not two, and definitely not a few steamy nights. 
But enemies or reluctant lovers, if they don't stop themselves soon, heaven will. So, there's that one. I like the green on him. And then lastly is death. Um, and I forgot to say this is by Laura Thalassus. Um, and so death. The day death comes to Lazarus Gauman town and kills everyone in one fell swoop, the last thing he expects to see is a woman left alive and standing. But Lazarus has her own extraordinary gift. She cannot be killed. Not by humans, not by the elements, and not by death himself. She is the one soul death doesn't recognize, one soul he cannot pry free from her flesh. Nor can he ignore the unsettling desire he has for her. Take her. He wants to desperately. And the longer she tries to stop him from his killing spree, the stronger the desire becomes. When Lazarus crosses the pass with the three other horsemen, an unthinkable situation leads to a terrible deal. To do death, save the world. A hopeless task made all the worse by the bad blood between her and Thanatos. But death's attraction to her is undeniable. And try though she might, Lazarus cannot stay away from that ancient, beautiful being and his dark embrace. The end is here. Humankind is set to perish. And not even the horsemen can stop death from fulfilling his final task. Only Lazarus can. So, um, this one sounds the most intriguing to me. Like I said, I really like death as a character. And there is one more bookmark. I forgot this one. And so this has the three older dogs. Ani wasn't part of this trip. Um, so we have Nidra, Marley, and Boo Boo. Uh, and then it says, a uh, quote from Tolkien, not all those who wander are lost. Um, and then you have Boo Boo and Nidra on the back. So, so yeah, this one is the one, uh, that I'm most intrigued by for sure. And then lastly, this is like the number one series I wanted. So I did listen to the first book on audio um, and uh, Sam from Green Eggs and Sam uh, turned me on to this series because it's the, like her, her, the first one is like her all time favorite book. Um, and so I listened to the first one on audio and then even though I struggled with it on audio, like, I got enough that I knew, like, I wanted the series. Uh, and so that's what I got. So my mother-in-law got me the first one in the series, which is not that one, um, which is Daughter of No Worlds by Carissa Broadbent. Um, and I just, I really enjoyed it. Like I said, I didn't quite grasp it fully. Um... So I'm excited to now have a physical copy that I can actually read. And I just, I love the cover and everything. So it says, a life in slavery, slavery taught to Sana how to survive with nothing but a sharp eye and a quick mind and a touch of magic. But the night she tried to buy her freedom, she nearly played with her life. Instead, she murdered the most powerful man in Thrill. Forced to flee, she has only one chance at saving those she left behind, pledging herself to the orders, an organization of magic wielders strong enough to destroy her former masters. To earn her place, Tisana is forced into an apprenticeship with Max Antarius uh, Farleone, a handsome and reclusive fire wielder who despises the orders. I really like Max. He's an awesome character. Um, he has no interest in helping her, but as the order's grip tightens around them both, his bloody past may be the key to her future or their downfall. Under looming war, Tisana must master her magic and survive the order's demands, and as her feeling for Max and Terry is deepened, she is forced to decide how much she is willing to trade away for revenge. The orders have bigger plans for Tisana, darker plans, but Tisana will stop at nothing to save those she abandoned, even if it means forfeiting her freedom and sacrificing her heart even if it means wielding death itself. So that's the first one. Really, really good. Like I said, I can't wait to read the physical copy so I can gain a better comprehension of the book itself. Um, and then I got the other two in the series, which the second one is Children of Fallen Gods. So we have that one. And then the third one is Mother of Death and Dawn. So and that's, they're both chunky, but that one's particularly chunky and really heavy. So anyway, really, really excited. So my mother-in-law got me the first one and then my husband had gotten me the other two. So that is the haul of my books that I got for Christmas. Uh, like I said, definitely got really, really spoiled this year, which was so overwhelming, but definitely I just warmed my heart so much. Like books make me feel so good. Um, every time I get books, I get like a little happiness rush. So, 
Um, yeah, I can't wait to dive into these. I'm definitely going to have to find a way to, to work them in um, sooner rather than later because all of these, like I said, I've been wanting to read for the last year. And so that's going to be the plan. I know this video was really, really long. So if you stuck around, thank you so much. Um, I got so many books that are, are added and ready to start the new year. Um, I am going to try to not do a book buying ban because I tried that last year and it did not work for me. Like that's kind of a way that I do an act of self-care, but I am going to try to be a little bit more choosy, especially going to the thrift stores because the thrift store, like, like newer books or more popular books that are more expensive. I don't tend to overspend as much because like it's, I'm more mindful of it. When I go to the thrift store, um, I'm not really overspending, but I am adding like a bunch of books that are just kind of, kind of sit here for a while. Um, so I am going to be kind of more mindful when I'm going out browsing and such, um, to really get books that I'm really, really interested in, uh, versus just going, oh, that sounds interesting and, and picking up just because it sounds interesting. Like I want books that I know what it's about. I've been seeing around and I've been anxious to get, but that's a worry for the new year. Um, I'm really happy to end off this year with these books and have these on my shelves ready to be picked up whether it's through my tbr game or just as kind of a mood read and an extra on top of whatever i get during my tbr game so anyway i'm gonna go ahead and leave you guys here happy reading everybody and i'll see you next time let me know down in the comments what you guys got if you got any books for christmas um or what your favorite book that you picked up this year was and yeah bye <laughs>